Welcome back everyone to the Cocos Lectures. Today we will go into module five and we will talk about SIMD vectorization. We will talk about streams and generally the blocking and non-blocking behavior of Cocos. And last but not least, we will talk about fine-grained tasking available in Cocos. As always, all our resources are online. You know, go to our Cocos GitHub organization to find all the repositories, uh, including the tutorials. There's also the wiki on the Cocos lectures, and that's where you find the slides, recording, and question and answer for the lectures. Uh, I already updated the link for the slides for the current session. So if you want to just download that on your own, you can go there right now. Uh, obviously, always the Cocos wiki, uh, that's the Cocos core wiki for the ABI reference. And then, you know, don't forget to join our Slack channel to ask questions and get help. We are in module five of our eight module series. Uh, we already talked about, you know, most of the things you would typically use in your applications. You know, we talked about the normal parallel dispatch. We talked about how to build things. We talked about data management and execution and memory spaces. We talked about some more complex data structures and multi-dimensional loops. And then last week, we talked about hierarchical parallelism. Uh, in particular, how you can use hierarchical parallelism to uh, you know, parallelize uh, hierarchical work how you can use the uh, leveraged thread teams uh, with a team policy and how that then helps you to parallelize inner loops or with nested parallel force using team thread range, thread vector range, as well as the team vector range. Um, we also talked about scratch space last time, the scratch memory, which you can use together with the team policy and that allows you to have thread or team private memory. Uh, we talked about the two use cases for that, the per work item temporary storage as well as the manual caching. And we talked about how that, uh, how that exposes on-chip user-managed caches, like for example, NVIDIA GPUs uh, shared memory or AMD GPUs shared memory. Uh, one important thing there, you need to determine the size before launching the kernel. And we talked also about how we have you know, uh, two levels of cache, one which maps to things like the shared memory on NVIDIA GPUs, and then one larger just going in high bandwidth memory, uh, which is largely used for per work item temporary storage. And last but not least, we talked about unique token, which gives you a, a thread safe portable way to get a unique ID on a per thread or per team basis. So before we go, uh, into our today's uh, lecture and topic, we gonna uh, I gonna again go to uh, uh, exercises and go through at least the team exercises uh, uh, of uh, last week. Let me click that correct. Here we go. So I'm again on my computer. I'm in the Cocos tutorials direct exercise directory. Uh, as always, Cocos itself is in the uh, in the Cocos Cocos directory in my home directory. So that's where the Cocos uh, the Cocos core GitHub is uh, cloned to. And uh, we had four exercises last time. We had the uh, general team policy, we had the team vector loop and the team scratch memory, as well as the unique token exercise. I'm gonna jump over with unique token exercise today because we might be running out of time, but I'm gonna go through the team exercises, which are, uh, I think, more important for people. So let's start with a general team policy. Or to begin, and to the uh, DP file here. As always, I'm looking for all the all caps exercise notes. First one says what we need to do. We need to convert to team parallelism uh, the, our typical loop, the one we had a lot. Uh, for that, two things one should usually do. We should uh, you know, do type defs or using statements for the team policy and as well as the, uh, the member type, the kind of team handle coming out of that thing. Then what we are now doing is we change the execution policy here 
from the range policy, which was used before, to the team policy. And the team policy takes now as its first argument n, the number of rows. We're going to launch one team per row. When I'm going to use Coco's auto uh, for, the, for the team size, because I don't, you know, I'm not sure what kind of team size I need. And then last but not least, I'm going to use a const member type reference for my team handle. Uh, team. The, it's still a reduction, so the reduction argument stays the same. There's no change on that. So now I want to convert that inner loop into uh, a nested parallel loop. The inner loop is still a reduction. It still does, you know, the sum into this temp2, which was previously a thread private variable. So we still need to do that. Consequently, we start with a parallel reduce. We now use the team thread range because that's the first nesting level. We split the range of M, you know, over the threads in the team. We give that policy, the team handle, as well as the total iteration count in this case. You can also give a begin and an end. We'll just capture by, now let's capture our value. Uh, and then we have the loop iteration, but it is a reduction. So we also need uh, uh, local, thread local reduction variable. Okay. We did the M, it's I as here. Okay, so that matches, it means we can delete this. Now, instead of summing into temp2, we're gonna sum into L sum and then store the final reduction variable value in temp2. Now, as we discussed in the in module four, every thread is executing everything, right? So this this loop in here in the, in the middle is just splitting the range over the already running threads. So every thread in the team has now temp2 as a result. Uh, and we would essentially get an overcount by a team size if we were to uh, with every thread contribute to the global sum. So what we need to do is we need to restrict that so that only one thread in the, in the, uh, in the team does that. And that's what we use the single statement for. Use the cocos per team here. We give that as the policy, we give it the team handle. We capture by reference in this case, and we actually have to capture it by reference because we're gonna uh, modify in the single statement for update. That is actually allowed. So for the single statement, you are allowed to update uh, uh, an individual uh, element, which is different from the from the parallel loops where you're not allowed to do that. Okay, so we're updating that and uh, this is now only done by one thread, so only one thread does contribute and that's actually already it. So if we now compile this thing, uh, we're going to compile that for GPU, we're almost correct. There's somewhere something missing, 157, 162. Um, right, we lost the J. Previously, we had here a parallel reduce, which got as an argument for J. So we need to figure out what is my uh, row, my J. Uh, there's the row index, right, or which row I'm doing. And we get that just from the team dot uh, uh, leak rank. So let's do that. Okay. Uh, and now we can run it, can see how that performs. Um, and uh, let's just get rid of the uh, warnings. Uh, 
paint equals spread. So what we see here is as we are running on the GPU, right? We compiled for the GPU by default, and we are getting 90 gigabytes a second, which is significantly lower than what we expect. So if we go back to the uh, to the start of the exercise, which actually is the same as the solution of uh, exercise three. So if we compile that guy and run it, we see, um, see that we should get about 500 gigabytes a second, right? And we are not getting that. So the question is, why don't we get that? And the answer is that uh, we're essentially screwing up the data access pattern right now. Why are we doing that? Uh, that's something we discussed in module four. Essentially, before we had a loop over the leftmost index, J. And so the default layout of A, which is layout left, was the correct layout. Now, the consecutive threads on the GPU access A uh, consecutively on, on index I. So what we need to do is we need to change the layout of A. Uh, the good thing is, this is just a type def. So we'll just go to layout right here instead of using the default layout. Uh, and if we do that and recompile our code. and rerun that, we're now getting the good performance, okay? Now, this is not much different, right, when the, when the exercise free, which had just the flat parallelism. The benefit of this approach is when we change the number of rows, right? So I'm keeping the total size constant, right, the 537 megabytes here. But what I'm changing is now I change the number of rows, right? I make, make each row longer, but have fewer of those. And uh, what we see here with, uh, with the team policy, right? I have now 1,024 rows of 65,000 length. We get about 730 gigabytes. But if I do that with the uh, exercise free, I'm only getting 23 gigabytes per second, right? The problem is that by only parallelizing over the number of rows, right, I don't have enough parallelism to saturate the GPU anywhere close, you know, not, again, I'm not, not even getting close. And so the team policy helps for low uh, row counts, you know, when I'm running out of parallelism to get better performance. On the other hand, if I'm, if my rows get really short, right, Say we do a six here, which should get, get us like uh, roll length 64. With a, with a flat parallelism, I still have 507 gigabytes a second. But if I do that with, uh, with the team policy, I'm now losing some performance. If I go here a bit even lower, right, and I go to five, uh, now I should lose significant performance versus this guy should probably still get roughly the same. Okay, so basically the team policy is a problem, you know, if you run out of parallelism on the inner loop, but if you have enough, you know, where then, and you don't have enough on the outer one, team policy is much better. Okay, let's go to the next one, the team vector loop. I'm not gonna talk as much about that there in the details. City begin. Uh, this one is very similar. Uh, now we just use the free level parallelism. And um, this loop already uses the team policy, right? it, uh, but it parallelizes the innermost loop of a team thread range and uh, leaves just as a sequential execution of the other loop. So what we want to do now is we want to make that loop uh, team thread range. So we just copy that thing over here, we rename we rename the, this guy to N and this guy to J and call this like the you know, update on N. Now we can delete this guy. Uh, we need a temp here for that. Double temp N. 
we don't actually need to initialize. Uh, parallel reduce does the initialization by default, so it doesn't sum up on top of what you already have. It uh, is this way. Okay, so now the problem is uh, we already had before here something which kind of is a single statement right for the team rank. But before this was the team thread range. What we are now using here is we're going to use the uh, thread vector range. And there isn't, uh, there isn't actually a way of doing just via, you know, is my rank something to do with. We actually need to use uh, a single statement here. So let's do that. Single. We are now within each thread, right? So we just need to restrict the vector lanes. So we want to do a per thread here. And what we do here is we not update update, but we need to do the inner update end. Okay. So that means only one guy uh, of the of the vector lanes does it here. And when we still need to do the, the next one, we need to sum up into temp n on this one and then do a cocos single cocos per team at this level to only have one guy in the team update the global sum. It hopefully that worked. Oh, it's not called team. What's it called? Team member. Okay, let's name the team member. And uh, now this one should also work. Okay, I'm not going to compare much in terms of like performance here. Uh, it's actually a slightly different code, right? It's uh, because it does the elements on top of the uh, on top of the uh, no. on top of the inner inner product, right? The a times y uh, uh, y x thing. Um, and you, so you need to compare it essentially to the begin situation of this guy. Um, but I want to get to the team scratch, which is more important. So the team scratch, uh, we look at that guy. Essentially starts with a solution of the previous version. And, uh, and what we need to do here is, uh, when you look at this code, right, for the X E I, that guy here isn't dependent on the J, right, on the team thread range. So what you can do is you can actually load that one uh, row out of the X E I thing, you know, one for the E, which comes just from the, uh, you know, from the outer loop, from the team member leak rank, and load that into scratch memory and then reuse it with every thread from scratch memory. So there's a couple things we need to do for that. First of all, we need to define the scratch view type. And the scratch view type is essentially what we had here. The only thing we need to change is we need to put in at the uh, memory space. And we are executing in the default execution space. And every one of these execution spaces has a scratch memory space type def as the memory space, and that is our, and that's now our uh, scratch view type. Now, the next thing is you have to calculate how much scratch memory do I need? And this needs to take into account things like, things like alignment, etc. And that's why you have to do that by a function. The function is a static function on the view type, and it takes as an argument, uh, whatever the, the runtime dimensions are of that view. And if we 
if we look back here, this, this guy here, this i goes over m, so this needs to be m long. So we'll ask for scratch memory size m. Now we need to tell the policy that I need that scratch memory. And we're gonna do that by uh, setting the scratch size for level zero. So we want that to live in GPU shared memory. Scratch size, the level, and then we want that per team. And we give it a scratch size. Close that, okay. Now we need to create the scratch view. And that's as essentially very similar to the, to the, uh, to the allocation of an unmanaged view. Just that what we do here is we give it as, instead of a pointer, we, uh, we give it a team scratch obtained from the team handle of level zero and the length. So now we have, now we have a shared memory view. What we need to do now is we need to fill this guy. And instead of doing that here with uh, just doing one member, we are gonna do that with a Cocos uh, Perl 4. And we are gonna use a Cocos team vector range. So just use all the parallelism you have. It goes over M entries. Just the Perl for loop, there's no reduction or something like that. And now we just write into x as xi x e comma e comma i. Uh, we're almost done. One thing we need to do is because this is a non-blocking operation, so every thread who's done with its iterations, you know, just continues and would go in here and so Everybody needs to wait until everybody is done with their work there. Yeah? So what we need to do is we need to call a team barrier here. So let's do that. And when we have done that, we now can just use sx down here. So now you get uh, all the excesses of x, you know, are now cached in, in, uh, in GPU shared memory. And I didn't do any mistake, very good. Okay, uh, we can see how this actually performs. I'm not even sure what it does here. Okay, so um, that got 750. And if we go back to the team vector loop uh, solution, that is essentially the starting point for that exercise, for the scratch exercise. Let's see what that guess. So we gained about 50% uh, performance on that problem. 256, 1024, 1024 versus, so it the same, team scratch. Let's see. Yeah, it's the same problem. So we gained about 50% bandwidth on that, which is, you know, not too bad uh, for a relatively small change. And that's essentially coming from that reuse of that uh, X vector. Okay, with that, I'm gonna go back to our actual lecture. Uh, if there aren't any questions left for it, Okay, so today we're gonna go into three topics. We're gonna start with SIMD and how to vectorize code with explicit vector types. Uh, after that, we will talk about the blocking behavior of, of Cocos a bit more. You know, we talked, uh, we always warned you that, you know, a lot of things are asynchronous, you know, and you can't rely on the stuff being done before uh, asking, you know, waiting for work to finish. So we'll talk a bit more in detail about what that means and how it actually works. Uh, we'll also talk about execution space instances, in particular about the 
interoperability with like uh, uh, streams in CUDA, for example, and how that all hangs together. And then last not, but not least, we're going to talk about tasking at the end. Okay, let's get started, SIMD. So uh, essentially SIMD, what we're talking about here is we're going to talk about portable vector intrinsic types and how you use these things to improve your vectorization. We're going to talk about how SIMD types are an alternative to uh, thread vector loops and how SIMD types actually help you achieve outer loop vectorization, which you can't, uh, which is otherwise really hard to get. Um, so vectorization in COCOS is always a hard topic and a lot of people ask us about that like all the time you know we say okay how how well does stuff vectorize etc and you know essentially it's complicated uh, there's basically two approaches right you can take right now one is you hope for the best uh, cocos semantics generally make loops vectorizable right uh, because we don't guarantee you like order of execution or how much concurrency there is or so uh, you can't actually legally write non-vectorizable code with Cocos. Uh, if you think a bit harder about it, you know, that's kind of nice. Uh, the problem is how to convey that to the compiler that that is actually true, right? And uh, often the compiler, you know, doesn't figure it out. Sometimes it does, you know, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, the other option is using hierarchical parallelism where it gets a little bit more explicit with a team vector range and frag vector range because what we do there is we help the compiler with hints such as pragma ivdep and pragma OMP simd. Um, there are some problems with that. A, not all compilers understand these guys. Uh, Pragma OMP SIMD has actually a problem why we uh, shied a, a bit away from it. It essentially forces vectorization, no matter whether the compiler thinks it's, it's profitable or not. And that is in particular a pro problem if you have additional kind of nested loops in there, you know, which in principle it could just sequentially do in the, uh, you know, in a vectorized manner. But, uh, Often the compiler at that point completely screws up and generates very, very inefficient uh, instruction sequences. And that's something uh, uh, where essentially we found that if we pragma use pragma OMP SIMD on all our loops, about half our codes get significantly slower. And so uh, we don't do that. Um, the pragma IVDAP itself mostly works with the Intel compiler and that actually usually works reasonably well. And that means that you know team vector range and thread vector range on Intel compilers are usually getting vectorized reasonably efficient. Uh, in particular, it doesn't turn off the, the, the performance heuristics. It just turns off the you know uh, just assume that everything uh, everything is vectorizable. You know, and there's no aliasing which prevents you from doing so. So. The general problem with all of this is, you know, that compilers a, often do not vectorize loops on their own. You know, that's for the hope for the best strategy. Uh, and another big problem is that an optimal vectorization strategy actually would require outer loop vectorization. And we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail in a bit. Uh, and last but not least, trying to use like team vector range or thread vector range as your vectorization mechanism sometimes requires you to in uh, introduce an additional loop level, even though you don't really need that. And you can see that for uh, a simple scenario where you would really want outer loop vectorization. So you have these two nested loops here, right? You have a loop over i and a loop over k. But k is often small, right? For physics reasons, it's often like weird numbers, like three and five and seven and stuff like that. Nothing which, you know, hardware really likes. Hardware li likes powers of two, you know, 16, 32 would be really awesome. But, uh, you know, seven, uh, five, three, not so much. Now, what you really want is that it vectorizes over n, right? If we lay the data out correctly and it just then does a sequential loop, you know, in a vectorized manner, that would be awesome. Uh, on top of it, the innermost loop also isn't super profitable to vectorize because it also does a reduction, right? So if you actually had there a loop of three and it would do that with an vector instruction, uh, you know, just the loop, then it still has to do the vector reduction. And so the, that will all eat up, you know, a, a lot of performance. Now you could do an efficient vectorization manner if you wanted to by introducing, uh, by essentially splitting the n loop and uh, somewhat kind of inverting the loop levels, right? So you start on the outer loop of a team policy, you divide the n by the desired kind of vector length. Uh, 
Then you do in a sequential manner the k-loop, and in that k-loop you do the thread vector range. Right? What you get with that is uh, you get now effective what what is effectively outer loop vectorization, and so you get the most effective kind of vectorization strategy for for this initial loop. But doing that obviously is kind of cumbersome, and uh, you know it's it's much harder to understand what does this do, right, compared to uh, what does this do, right? You have to think a lot about uh, eh, what's going on here. So we don't really like that. And that's where SIMD types help. Uh, so SIMD types were introduced, uh, you know, partly for that, but partly also for just that we didn't have auto vectorizing compilers back in the day. Uh, and so what we SIMD types are is they essentially are short vectors of scalars. They have all these operators like plus equal, times equal, uh, etc., on them. So you essentially can use them as if they were scalars. And what we do is we just do element-wise operations. They're usually compile time sized and they usually map directly to some hardware vector intrinsics like uh, you know AVX512 and stuff like that. So the important concept is here that the SIMD type is a or a SIMD variable is a short vector which acts like a scalar. And if you use such SIMD types, you can achieve, uh, achieve outer loop vectorization simply by replacing your scalars with SIMD uh, types and uh, you know, cutting the outer loop count by the SIMD length. So let's look at that, right? We had before the, these two views here. Uh, that was nice. So if we want now to use SIMD, you know, and this is, uh, don't take that too serious right now. This is more like pseudocode. Uh, we replace the scalar type with a SIMD type. Uh, we adjust the loop count by uh, V, you know, by the vector length. And then the rest looks the same. The only thing you have to take care of, you know, is that hopefully, you know, the layout of A was such that uh, this was kind of okay. But that's the principle, I, in principle, the idea, right? And that looks much nicer than uh, the introducing a team vector uh, loop in there. So there is actually a proposal for the C++ standard uh, to introduce SIMD types. It isn't in the draft yet, but there is a technical specification and we are hoping that that makes it into C++23. And uh, how that type looks like is it's a class, it's templated on the scalar type, it's also templated on something called the ABI. And that's something we're going to talk about in a little bit. But then inside of it, you know, you can figure out what is, what is the scalar type, you know, uh, what is, uh, and then what, what is the size. Uh, you can copy and from and to uh, just arrays of scalars. You can also access each individual element. And then it has all these element by operators, you know, like plus equal, times equal, minus equal, uh, and stuff like that, as well as the non-member operators defined. So all these math operations uh, work with it. Uh, the interesting innovation here is this ABI parameter. And what that allows you to do is it allows you for uh, essentially to have different hardware specific implementations. Uh, the most important ones in this particular proposal is there's an, a scalar ABI, which essentially gives you a single element uh, in the SIMD type. So it's length one or size one. There's this fixed size one where you just tell it, you know, I want eight elements or 16 elements in there. Uh, I think we restrict n to be a power of two. There's a max fixed size of T. So it, you essentially give it, I want, I want uh, say doubles. You please figure out on my current architecture I'm compiling for, what is the kind of max logical size uh, for, uh, for a vector of doubles on this architecture? Because you know, it's like a 512 bit or 256 bit uh, uh, vector length, you know, or vector registers. And then there's native, which simply is, says, you know, figure out what is the, native one. Uh, often max fixed size and native might actually be the same. But there's a couple of problems with it. First of all, obviously it's not in the standard yet, even if it's in getting in the standard, it's C++ 23 standard, you know, so it's gonna be like, I don't know, uh, I think after our current uh, agreements with our users, it's gonna be uh, 2028 before we are allowed to rely on, uh, as a require C++ 23. So uh, that's quite a ways out. Uh, and on top of it, it doesn't actually support GPUs in a 
good way. It also has some other problems, uh, you know, with missing functionality, like for example, uh, gather scatters, which make it hard to use for us. So at Sandia, we actually had SIMD types, and we had not just one, we had five different SIMD types in use, uh, which was a little bit of a mess. So we started the unification effort, uh, which had the goal of, you know, that A, we kind of match the standard SIMD API as far as possible. We support GPUs, you can use it standalone or in conjunction with Cocos, and it hopefully replaces all the current implementations at Sandia so that we can uh, make that work. And we have something which works, it's still considered experimental, but uh, it's a pretty robust experimental. I mean, it's robust enough that our actual production applications are using that already for real simulations, right? Uh, and that supports like x86, it supports ARM, it supports power, it supports NVIDIA GPUs and so on. And we're starting to integrate that into Cocos proper, into Cocos Core. So we just get it with Cocos Core instead of having to download the extra repository. So as with the C++23 SIMD type, it takes a scalar argument in an ABI. Uh, whereas three really common ABIs, native is, you know, what is ever is best for the scalar type. Scalar is a single element and pack is uh, n scalars. We're probably gonna rename that into fixed size to align with the C++23 standard at some point. Um, you can also alias with scalar views, you know, as long as you're careful with layout and length. Obviously, if you do it for 1D things, you know, it's relatively simple. So you can actually do both way around, right? You start with a, SIMD, a view of SIMD types, you know, of length n, and then the the, the double view would just be uh, n times sim dt size, right? And you just get the pointer out, you, pa you cast the pointer through double star and, uh, and do whatever you want. And then uh, uh, you can also do it the other way around, right? Where you start with a scalar view and then you cast it into uh, a sim d view. Obviously, in this case, you better make sure that m is actually dividable by the sim d size, otherwise, you're going to get uh, into trouble. Okay. So that's the rough, you know, kind of uh, how you interact uh, and switch between SIMD types and, and, uh, and scalar types, which is really important because it allows you to use the SIMD types just in the few kernels where you really need it, right, instead of like everywhere. Um, and there's an exercise for that. Uh, this exercise essentially just uses the simple stuff we uh, we just showed. So what you do is in this exercise, you include the SIMD header, you uh, change the data type of the views from, uh, from simple double to SIMD double, then you adjust you know, all, the, all the loop counts and you uh, create an unmanaged view of double from the SIMD thing to do a final reduction, okay? Uh, that's the way how this guy works. So the above exercise, when you use native, actually on GPUs will only use uh, uh, the scalar ABI. So the, by default on GPUs, the native ABI is actually the scalar ABI. And the question a lot of people ask is why wouldn't we actually use fixed size instead or you know, packed? So a, a fixed size ABI will create a scalar of size N in each CUDA thread. So if you create a temporary, right, you get n elements, n scalar elements in every thread. So if you then load this fixed size thing, you actually get into trouble, right? Because you have uncoalesced access now. Uh, on top of it, in normal code with scalar stuff, right? If you use the correct layouts, you already get out of loop vectorization, right? The code above, right, if you had uh, the, the original code for the outer loop vectorization, if A is laid out such that, your, uh, that it's lay, layout left, right, as we, as we have in default, then you already have outer loop vectorization, right? Warp already accesses uh, consecutive elements. So there isn't really anything to be gained. But there is sometimes cases where you really want uh, warp level parallelization, okay? And that's where we did a new innovation, and that is uh, that we need two SIMD types. We need a storage type and a temporary type, which are closely connected to each other. And that's something we have. We have uh, every one of our SIMD types has a storage type associated with it. And uh, what that means is that you store, use the storage type as your, you know, what you allocate, what you create your views with, 
and you use the actual SIMD types for the temporary variables, okay? In most cases, storage type and SIMD type are actually the same thing, but sometimes we are not. And that's in particular true for the CUDA warp ABI. And the CUDA warp ABI is a very explicit thing. Essentially what we say is we will use warp level parallelism inside of it. Effectively, we actually use the, uh, the, the thread vector range inside of it, right? So every operation with, with a SIMD type of, that, of this type will actually have a nested thread vector range in it. And so what you do is you use that in conjunction with the team policy. But let's look at that uh, just a tiny bit, you know, or more to make that a bit clearer, hopefully. Uh, maybe it doesn't make it clearer, but I tried my best to put a graphics together what happens. So say you have a code like that, right? You create a view of the double ABI storage type, you run a team policy, uh, you know, with maybe with a V or not uh, ever, and we set that to a specific thing. And then you load this into, from the, from the view into a temporary. So what happens at that load? If your ABI is the pack eight, with a, and you use an int V equal one here, right? Uh, if you use V equal eight, uh, seven of the threads will just not, as we all will just do redundant execution, right? We don't do anything different. But say we do this, right? What then happens is at the load, uh, first thread zero will load the first element of its, uh, of A zero. Thread one will load the first element of A one. Thread two will load the first element of A two. Thread three will load the first element of A three. And then they go on. Your SIMD type on one particular thread is actually eight elements and registers, right? It's this dashed area here. And they loaded one by one, but they loaded very inefficiently, right? Because what you see here is a strided access in memory, right? Thread zero and thread one are eight elements apart. Well, if you use the CUDA warp ABI, which has a different storage type, right? The storage type is actually still this packed kind of storage type, but the, but the temporary type has one element per thread. And so the, the, the eight long vector actually spends eight threads on the, in, in the warp. And so when you load the first guy here, every thread loads exactly where one element and all the A zeros are loaded, right? And that's because you use the vector, uh, and that's why you have to use the vector range eight here. Uh, and so your vector essentially spends multiple threads. If you load the next element, right, it would go into, uh, everybody would go to the next uh, SIMD here. Okay, so how does that look in a bit more detail? So you start with like your SIMD type, right? With a CUDA warp ABI. Uh, then you figure out the storage type, use the storage type to create your views. Then you do your loop and you use the vector length V here, the same as you used for the CUDA warp one. You do your team thread range and within that, you load an element. That's what where happens, what we just discussed. You then can do all these operations, right? Like times uh, temp times equals two, right? It's actually a ve thread vector range internally where, where everybody, uh, you know, multiplies their elements. Uh, and then you write it out again and where every thread writes exactly one element back in a, in a coalesced manner. You could also just do that inline, right? This is, I, I just broke it out to make it a bit clearer, but this is exactly what would happen if you just wrote it all in one line, right? Okay, there's an exercise for that thing. Uh, and uh, in that exercise, uh, we are using that effect, right? Using the, the, the CUDA warp ABI and the storage and so on. And uh, we're still kind of poor, uh, you know, doing reduction just with scalars. So that will still work. Um, one word of warning because we are using effectively the thread vector range internally, right? You are not allowed when you use, or you, you can't really mix, you know, SIMD operations and explicit thread vector ranges, right? You cannot use SIMD operations of the CUDA warp uh, ABI inside a thread vector range or a team vector range. If you did that, you would only get partial execution. Okay. 
Um, one thing we're going to do for that is we'll probably try and uh, get a pass in our uh, Clang tidy version, which can detect this kind of stuff and tell you when you do that. There's a bit more. Uh, so Corpus SIMD supports all kinds of math operations. So we have things like apps and square root and exponential, etc. So that's all there. And it also supports masking. So masking is something you need if you have conditionals in your code. For example, think about this kind of scalar code, right? So you have this for, this for loop over n, uh, and you say, if ai is smaller than 100, then set bi to ai, otherwise set bi to 100, right? So essentially you set it either to ai or to the maximum threshold, right? It's kind of like a hard cutoff at the top. Um, now, this is actually something people do in signal processing, and uh, that's kind of where that example comes from. And in signal processing, we really want to vectorize it because we want it really to be efficient. So what you do is you start with your SIMD type, right? And then there is a mask type, which is also, you can get the correct mask type from the SIMD type because the length of a mask type, you know, depends on your ABI and your scalar type is what you need. So what you do now is you create two SIMD variables, right? One for the 100 and one for, uh, and then you, you load your AI from the, uh, from A or the vectorized version, you know, the SIMD version of A. And what you now do is you create that mask and that mask, you get that simply as a result from like comparison operators, like smaller than or larger than or whatever, or equal, you know, and that returns the mask type. So we'll take that mask and what you now have is there's a SIMD colon colon choose function. And that takes a mask type as its first argument and then two uh, vector types. And what that does is it returns, depending on whether an element is, is true or false in that mask type, it either returns the first or the second. It's kind of like the ternary operator and then writes that into B. And so that is the vectorized version of this with the conditional. So as a summary, what we learned here is that uh, we have SIMD types, which can help you with vectorizing code. It helps you in particular with outer loop vectorization, which otherwise is either cumbersome or almost impossible. There's storage and temporary types, which are important for uh, getting this work on, on GPU, if you really want vectorization on GPU. Or in many cases, you just can get away with like the the scalar ABI. So if you just use the native ABI, you know, in most cases, you don't need to do anything special for GPUs. And the SIMD types are mostly there to make your code more efficient on the CPU side. You can do masking uh, that is supported. And uh, while it's currently considered experimental, you know, it's pretty ready for use. Uh, if you go there, download it, you know, please try it out, provide feedback. Uh, we are happy to incorporate feedback and stuff. Uh, in particular, since we're going to move it soon into uh, Cocos proper. Okay, do we have any questions on the SIMD things I should answer here? Um, there was one question whether complex uh, can be used as a scalar type. Yes, it can. Yep. Well, it's an actual interesting question. So, so complex is an interesting case. Because you can either do a SIMD of complex or you can do a complex of SIMD. And it's not always clear which of the two is better. Right? But in principle, both of them work with Cocos. And we had a user who actually tried both of them out and tried to figure out you know, when is, which, which of the two is better when. OK. So with that, we come to an really interesting topic, uh, topic of asynchronicity and streams. Uh, essentially, you know, we're gonna talk about the non-blocking behavior or blocking behavior of Cocos operations. Uh, we'll learn, you know, which of those are which uh, and how, you, you know, what kind of work can actually overlap and how you wait for completion. And in particular, also we're gonna see how to run uh, multiple kernels simultaneously on a GPU. So first of all, most operations in Cocos are non-blocking. That means the caller returns before the operation is finished. 
That also means the caller can do other things while that operation is executing. Okay. Um, if you think about that, right, if you say, oh, this is all just dispatch and it just goes somewhere, you know, one question which comes up is, so what is the ordering behavior of that? And effectively what happens here is, you know, the basic rule is that execution spaces are, or more precise execution space instances have an ordered execution queue. So they execute operations in the order they are received, right? In the order they are dispatched. It's a first in, first out queue, a 5 queue, okay? So the important thing is execution spaces execute operations dispatched to them in order, in dispatch order. Okay. And that is a guarantee. Operations execute in order. Now, where are execution space instances, okay? Uh, so far, we haven't really talked about instances. We talked about types, right? We talked about how you use them as temp uh, template parameters. But there are actually instances of these things. And each instance has, or each unique instance, has its own execution queue, okay? The execution policies can take such instances as a first argument. And that is how you determine which queue the operation will be enqueued on. The same is true for deep copy. Deep copy can take an instance as a first argument, and that means the deep copy goes into that queue. Now, we never use any instances. And what happened in those cases is that we, uh, you know, that if you don't provide an instance to something like uh, an execution policy, it actually uses the default instance. And the default instance is a singleton, which you get if you uh, default construct an execution space type. Okay, so if you default construct an execution space type, you get the default instance back. And that is if you use, if you do not specify an instance. So uh, these two things here are equivalent, right? Saying policy, you know, zero comma one, the range policy is zero comma one, and using, you know, XX space default constructor zero comma n is the same thing. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do, go through a lot of scenarios, you know, of what happens if you do certain things. And I'll, I worked really hard on creating uh, some uh, pictures and graphics to, you know, illustrate what's going on. Within these slides and the code examples I'm going where we are using certain, uh, we are reusing certain like uh, keywords uh, many times. So generally device is the Cocos default execution space here, host is the Cocos default host execution space. Then there is instances, def1, def2, as well as host1 and host2 potentially. Whereas policies, uh, device policies end with a D, uh, host policies with an H. Uh, there's also a D1 and D2 and H1 and H2, which are the policy instances which actually got uh, execution space instance as an argument. Uh, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5 are just lambdas, uh, in, uh, in particular parallel four lambdas, and R1 is a parallel reduce lambda. Okay. So let's start really simple. So we said most Cocos operations are asynchronous. Uh, generally, it's best to assume that all of them are asynchronous uh, and maybe just remember the one or two, you know, really important exceptions. Because we are asynchronous, we are non-blocking, we overlap the work in the process thread, right? So your process thread is essentially a thread which executes main. You dispatch work to a parallel four, right? You know, create here the policy, you dispatch a lambda there or a functor or whatever, and then you call foo and then you call fence, right? So foo will now execute while L1 is running. And you need to call fence in order to make sure that all the work is finished, right? And fence will only return after all the work is really finished. So fence will potentially take a really long time, even though it's just essentially looping or spin waiting or something like that, right? You can dispatch multiple kernels one after another. And what happens is these kernels get injected into the queue of device, right? The second call doesn't block, it doesn't wait until the first call is done, right? It just dispatches work into the queue 
And so foo can actually still overlap even with L1, assuming you know that foo is uh, L1 takes long enough. And if you wait, if you if you do a fence, it waits for everything, right? You could execute foo first, right? If you do the parallel four foo, and then the next parallel four. Obviously, the second parallel four dispatch waits until foo is done, right? Uh, so, if L two depends on foo, right? Because foo is just modifying some data. L two is actually going to use like you know UVM data or host, host pin space or something, something which is accessible from the device, right? Then uh, obviously you have to dispatch that in that order, right? If foo is independent of L2, or rather L2 independent of foo, right, then what we did before is better because in this case, right, if foo takes longer than L1, you waste time on the device. Okay. If you have different execution spaces, right, work dispatch to them will potentially overlap. Work dispatch to different execution spaces is independent of each other. These are two independent execution queues. And it, worked, it overlaps with each other as well as the process thread. Right? So I create here two policies, right? a host and device policy as well as uh, uh, three lambdas. And I dispatch you know, a device, a host, a device call. See that here, you know, the blue, the green, and then the L3. And all of that can happen, you know, that dispatch before even here L2 starts doing anything, you know, because it takes a little bit of time to get the dispatch uh, done and it all started up. Uh, but all of that can happen and we can all overlap with each other and we can all overlap with foo. Cocos fence will fence everything. So it fences both device and host. So if L2 were to take longer than, uh, than, uh, than L1 and L3 together, you know, then it would just wait until L2 is done. Okay. Now, in reality, that is not really what happens. Okay. In reality, most of our host backends are actually blocking. Like, for example, OpenMP backend, right? It starts a Pragma OMP parallel or a Pragma OMP parallel 4 internally. And the Pragma OMP parallel 4 is a blocking operation, so it doesn't return you know, until it's done. And that means what actually would happen is this, right? You dispatch L1, you dispatch L2, L2 overlaps with this maybe GPU kernel, but then it's gonna wait, right? The, this call, this call to parallel 4 only returns after this kernel is done and then dispatches L3, okay? Which means if L3 and L2 are independent, which we have to be because semantically, right, they are overlapping, then it would have been much better to first dispatch L3 instead of waiting on, uh, you know, instead of dispatching the host thing first. Uh, so essentially, if you have, you know, parallel work for host and device, dispatch the device, all the device work first, because most of the host backends are not, uh, are not non-blocking or we are blocking. One exception is potentially HPX, which can actually do non-blocking work, right? And where we would get the picture I showed before. The important thing is do not rely on the blocking behavior of, of, of the reality of how our host backends are working right now. There might be future versions of OpenMP where we can actually do non-blocking dispatch. We may rewrite our, our uh, threads backend to not use the master thread, right? And just use worker threads, in which case we they become uh, non-blocking, right? So you cannot rely on that, okay? But for performance reasons, it's important to know because it would mean that, you know, if you, if you knew that, that it would be, have been better to dispatch L3 first. So another thing which is blocking and which is actually guaranteed to be blocking is reductions to scalars. So if your result of a, scale, uh, of a reduction is a scalar value, like a double, an int or whatever, right? The call to parallel reduce only returns after the result is available to the host thread, okay? Which means 
if you dispatch a uh, Perl 4 and then a Perl reduce and then just call foo, right, which may need to use result, that is legal and that is correct. It also means that L1 obviously is going to be done, right, because the FIFO implies that L1 is going to be done before R1 executes. Okay, so this is blocking. Uh, which also means that, you know, if you do R1 first, right, uh, it only returns, you know, after it's done and then only then L1 is getting dispatched, right? In this case, L1 would still overlap with foo, right? Because it all happens after uh, the reduction is done. Now, reductions to views, when you give a view as a, uh, final result are semantically non-blocking. Uh, I have to admit in some cases we haven't implemented that correct yet, right, even for GPUs, but uh, for most cases that is true. That means from a blocking perspective we behave like Perl 4, right, and it means that the results will only be available after you call a Cocos fence. And this is even true for unmanaged views of host variables. So if you had done this, right, you had created your double result, you create an unmanaged view in host space, right, around that result, and you give that as the result argument for Perl reduce. It is non-blocking. It will overlap with foo1, right? It will overlap even with foo2, right, if it takes long enough, because the, you know, the Perl4 will just dispatch into the queue and R1 is still running, right? So it will potentially even still overlap with foo. And you can only read the result here after you called fence, okay? No. Another operation which is blocking is if you call the simple two argument deep copy, okay? And that deep copy operation is implying a full fence before the copy. And what do I mean with full fence? I mean full, full fence. It fences everything, every execution space. Okay. It means the cop, it means not only that you're allowed to deep copy here, uh, your source, right? Is something L1 could have modified. It also means but L2 can rely on dest being updated correctly, right? So both L1 can modify source and L2 can read dest. That is legal. A deep copy with just two view arguments implies a full fence, okay? It also implies a full fence if the deep copy happens to be a no-op because source is the same as dest. However, there is a deep copy operation which is non-blocking, and that is the one where you give it a space argument as the first argument. And what happens if you give it a space argument? Semantically, the deep copy is inserted into the execution queue of that uh, execution space instance. Okay? Like I'm doing this, I, I do a Perl 4 in the device, I'll hand it the device uh, or, you know, def1 or whatever, and I give it a Perl 4, you know, another device. Uh, what now happens is that you can rely in L2 on dest being done, right? And you can modify source in L1 because it goes into the same queue. But all of this will overlap with foo, right? And the fence will wait for all these things to be done. So foo couldn't rely on dest or source being, uh, you know, dest being written. You could also do this, right? You run a Perl 4 and now you give it, you, you execute the deep copy in the host execution queue. And then you run another Perl 4. The deep copy will now overlap with this guy 
and potentially this guy, depending on how long it takes. It potentially also overlaps with foo, okay? And actually, this is actually reality what happens if you compile for CUDA. What our deep copy does there is it actually has, uh, it has under the hoods in, uh, you know, some mechanism to essentially do an asynchronous CUDA mem copy, uh, which overlaps with all the work we dispatched, right? And also is asynchronous to the host. So this actually can happen, right? In this case, you can neither have L1 modify source or read dest or whatever, right? Nor L2 use dest and source. And foo can also not rely on dest and source. So that brings us to the question, what about CUDA streams? Up to now, we only used the default execution space instances, right? But what if you want to have concurrent kernels on the GPU? Uh, and the point is that execution space instances behave largely like CUDA streams. And you can actually create different instances. For now, it's a fairly new capability. Uh, and the initial version of this is essentially more for interoperability with CUDA hip than, you know, like a real full native thing. Some execution spaces actually can only give you back the, the default instance, like OpenMP, for example, right? We cannot actually split the OpenMP thread pool into two and uh, give you two different instances you can then dispatch to asynchronously, right? That doesn't work with OpenMP. Um, so what you would get in OpenMP is that every instance is just the default instance, so it's not a unique instance, which means they will uh, block with each other. You can still write the code as if you had multiple instances, right? It's just that nothing will overlap with each other. And everything will block. But in CUDA and HIP, we can actually do that. And the way that works in CUDA uh, is that you essentially create your CUDA stream, and then you, get, uh, you create a CUDA instance by handing it the stream. We are working on having a generic version of creating these guys, you know, essentially create generic instances. There's actually some example code in the performance tests for execution space instances, which you could copy if you are so inclined. Um, but uh, that is something we're looking at. One thing about this is execution space instances are like shared pointers. So you can just hand them off, you know, by value. And uh, we're actually like shared pointers, right? So if you do that, how does that work? Each instance, each unique instance of an execution space owns their own execution queue. So work dispatched to different instances can overlap with each other, also with a host process. And you can call Cocos fence to wait for all of them. So in this case, right, I have two different uh, device instances. Say I created two CUDA instances, gave them two different CUDA streams. Uh, I created two policies using one for the handing one the first and one the second one. And then I use them to dispatch, right? And what now happens is that L2 can overlap with L1 and L3. And both of them overlap with foo. And Coco's fans will wait for everything to finish. The same is true for deep copies. Right. If you hand that def1 as the deep copy, we essentially insert a CUDA mem copy, uh, async mem copy into this particular associated CUDA stream. So that will just work as well, right? And the deep copy will overlap with uh, work in other instances. The deep copy is, is inserted into the execution queue of def1. You can also call instance fences, right? So say I dispatch now really complicated, right? Say I had like HBX as my backend and I had two different instances here, two different thread pools, you know, which are asynchronous. I can create all these guys, right? And dispatch them all and they are all asynchronous. They all overlap with each other, including the deep copy. But now I need to wait on the deep copy and uh, because foo relies on destination, okay? In that case, I don't really want to fence, you know, my L3 kernel. I don't want to wait on my L2 kernel. I only want to wait on my deep copy. <clears throat> so what you do is you just call the fence, the non-static, as so this is a member function, right? A non-static member function uh, 
on that space instance. And that will only wait until all the work in that particular instance is done, right? So L2 can just go through that fence, the same as L3. Now I do foo, and then I say, now I need to wait for all the results before I dispatch my next work, right? And that's when you call the Cocos fence. Okay. One last thing, a slight reality check. When Cocos views deallocate, we actually imply a fence right now. This is largely due to limitations of reference counting. It's not a semantic choice, okay? That means you shouldn't really rely on it. But again, as with uh, you know, most host backends are actually blocking, it's something to know about uh, if you optimize performance, right? So what happens in this case is I have a, you know, I have a, a scope here and I create a view inside here which means when it goes out of scope here, it goes away, right? And maybe L1, L2, or L3, or L4 use temp. But what happens at this point here is, because temp goes out of scope, it deallocates and, uh, and implies a full fence. Everything waits before foo executes. The limitation here is that for some execution spaces, uh, we cannot implement proper, uh, or we, we weren't able without a performance penalty uh, and you know significant performance penalty uh, to implement proper reference counting uh, for things which are asynchronously dispatched. Okay, so essentially the problem is that the CUDA functor doesn't call it destructor, right? Because it needed to be mem copied over there. And, and that, causes, that causes a problem. Uh, that causes a problem. Uh, on top of it, if we were to introduce it, we would need to have like reference counting, which goes cross device, which also would cause, you know, significant performance issues. So we didn't do that. We instead just fence on deallocation to make sure that everything which is still outstanding and using this guy potentially, uh, you know, gets its work done before we yank, yank the allocation out underneath. It's just something to be aware of, you know, uh, but again, do not rely on that behavior. Maybe at some point we find a really fast way of doing it and we're gonna change that. Okay, so with that we come to a summary Execution space instances execute work in order of dispatch. Operations dispatched to different execution space instances can overlap. There's a default instance for every execution space and uh, you can use Cocos Fence to wait for completion of all outstanding work. You can use the member function of an execution space instance to wait for the completion of outstanding work dispatched to just that specific execution space instance. Do we have any questions I should answer on this? Mm, there was a question with uh, on the Cocos kernel side, uh, the plus like function of blocking or not. And if you don't know the answer, we can have uh, the, an the answer in September for the module. But... Yeah, we'll have the proper answer then. I think at this point, most of them are blocking. Uh, but we are working on, on, we are planning to introduce the, the, an interface which also takes the space argument so that you can, for example, also make use of like the streams and stuff like that. In which case we would become non-blocking. Kind of like the deep copy, right? Okay. With that, uh, Daisy, are you ready to take over? Can we make Daisy, hopefully Daisy is here. Uh, yeah. Unmute. Hi, um, yeah, I'm ready to present. I am, uh, the internet just went out in my entire area. 
which is super awesome. Uh, but I am tethered to my phones, so we'll see how this works. Okay, I'll stop sharing and you can take over. All right. Uh, share this one. Come on. Sorry, I'm... Uh, Screen sharing failed to start. Am I allowed to share screen? Um, I think only Austin, you can grant you the... Yep. Ah, I got it. Okay, does okay. everyone see this? Uh, yep. oh, we're not going back. All right. So we're going to talk about um, task-based parallelism here in Cocos. Cocos has a uh, facility for fine grain tasking within a kernel. Uh, we are working on a facility, a similar facility for, for coarse grain task based programming within Cocos. So uh, this is uh, where you need dependent uh, parallelism of some sort. You need to define some sort of structure um, in the uh, in your in your program. Um, can people still hear me? I the um, my, it says my internet's going in and out. I just want to make sure. Um, all right. If I don't hear anything, then that's fine. Uh, so we're going to talk about how to express some dynamic uh, dependency structures. And again, this only applies to um, dependency structures within a kernel right now. But it's a good thing to get some experience with in terms of the general paradigm of, of task-based programming, uh, since we will be doing this in coarse grain kernels very soon. That interface is coming uh, probably in the next uh, major release at the very least. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about when you can use it. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to dive in. This is going to be uh, a little bit um, going into the deep end. If you have never, uh, if you've never done any kind of task-based programming before, then uh, it, it, and you're watching this on YouTube, might be a good time to um, go look up task-based programming or future promise programming or programming with futures. Um, that kind of general paradigm of what when, when we really need to separate the call site of a function or stack frame from its return site, right? That's really what we're doing fundamentally, right? You've got this, this, this base paradigm in synchronous computing of a call stack, right? One function calls another, calls another, calls another, and then they return back to each other. In, in asynchronous programming, <clears throat> when you need to dispatch multiple functions and have different return points for them or connect them in different ways, uh, you need separate representations of the spawn point and the return point. And so we're going to talk about how Cocos represents those. And Cocos uses a bit of an advanced representation of these things. So uh, if it is, it is better to be comfortable with task-based programming going into this, uh, if you can be. Um, and if you are, this should look pretty straightforward. It's an extension to a little bit more modern paradigm. But uh, yeah, I'm going to dive in and um, uh, hopefully people can follow me and uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. All right, so so far we've mostly talked about data parallel programming and of course you can do data parallel programming with task parallel programming, but task parallel programming adds this element of dependency structure, right, um, to programming. And so our, uh, in, in Cocos, our primary kind of idiom that we have is this pattern policy functor uh, grouping. Uh, and we, we have this for data parallel code with like a parallel for and a range policy and some functor, right? And uh, for task parallel code, you, you have the similar uh, idiom where you have a, a set of interchangeable patterns, a set of interchangeable policies, and a particular structure of a functor that you have to give us. Um, and we're going to talk about what's special in tasking about all three of those. Um, so let's dive in. Uh, so the first thing, kind of simplest thing, is that uh, is the functor. And for tasking, at least as it is right now, 
we don't support lambdas. We only support functors. And um, tasking functors have to explicitly declare their output type using this value type um, type alias. Uh, so uh, this is just like with uh, parallel reduce, where uh, you output via a parameter, right? The, the last parameter is how you express your output of the parallel reduce. It's the same way with a task, right? When a task returns without respawning itself, and I'll talk about what that means in a second, the output of the task is what is returned from what what is is set assigned to this parameter at that point, right? Uh, and then that output can then be used by other tasks that depend on this task. We'll talk about how you do that in a second too. But the uh, important point here is that you have to match your your output type to this value type uh, tag. We also recommend that you use a template here to deduce the team member type. There is a way to get the actual team member type. It's just to ask the scheduler. I think it's scheduler colon colon member type. Um, and I'll talk about what scheduler is in a second. But uh, unless you have a really good reason to, we recommend that you don't separate the um, uh, declaration from the implementation here. Um, and you just use the, uh, make this a template. This is for, this is targeted, this interface currently is targeted at fine grain tasking, which really needs to be, um, which is, is for things that are small enough where the compiler really needs to be just able to see the definition so it can do some inlining and things like that. So uh, it makes sense anyway to have these things be, um, be templates and, and be in header files. Uh, so yeah. Uh, that's, that's basically all there is to the functor. Uh, this team member type is, has all of the same, um, has all of the same uh, uh, functionality of a parallel, uh, a team policy um, from hierarchical parallelism uh, team member. So you can do, if you've launched it as a team task, you can do a, um, uh, you can do hierarchical parallelism. You can only do one one level of hierarchical parallelism. It's only um, currently we only support uh, with uh, Coco's team task uh, policy. We only support um, team thread range uh, loops inside, uh, and you'll see how that works in a second. So I've already alluded to this. We have two policies right now: uh, task team and task single. Um, they do exactly what they sound like they do. Task single runs the task with a, a single worker thread. Task team uh, gives it a team policy. Um, both of them uh, take a scheduler and then uh, a predecessor if you need the, the task to be predicated on something. And they can also take a, a priority. And we talk about how we express predecessors in just a second here. Um, so uh, what, finally, what are the, the patterns that we have? So uh, Coco's task spawn and Coco's host spawn are basically the way that you create tasks. Um, you know, it is your um, call, the equivalent of your call site, right? For an asynchronous function call here. And uh, host spawn is, is, is you only call it from outside of a task kernel or a task um, functor task spawn is called only inside of a task functor, um, and uh, that is it, it is more to kind of distinguish what level you're at, um, whether you're on the host or on the device, and whether host spawn always leads to a a kernel launch of some sort. Um, interacting with the uh, driver. Part of the purpose of Coco's tasking is that some of these calls in the driver were, um, some of these things in the driver, in the CUDA driver were too expensive and we needed ways to do them uh, without going through the CUDA runtime system. Um, and so host spawn does still do a spawn through the runtime system, whereas task spawn um, just enqueues into the Coco's tasking system. Coco's respawn is not really a proper, um, pattern. Uh, it doesn't follow the same rules 
the argument order is backwards and the first argument is this, not star this. Um, there are reasons for that that are historical. Um, if we had to do it again, we would make it follow the same pattern, but we have unfortunately code in use in the wild that we would have to change. And um, so it's, it's possible this will get an update in the future, but uh, for now, this is, um, this is uh, how Kogos Respawn works. So just look at how it's done in the examples and copy it and you'll get used to it. But um, yeah, uh, and task spawn and host spawn both return to Cocos future, which we'll talk about on the next slide. It's how you represent kind of the output part of uh, the asynchronous function call. It is how we represent uh, the task um, and its completion. So, um, and it's, and it's, as and it's used as a dependency in the future. So uh, let's look at a very simple example. This like is a really simple like uh, recursive chain of tasks that we're creating here, right? And so uh, you're usually going to store um, any kind of data members that you need uh, across multiple calls as uh, data members of the functor rather than as um, as things on the stack and you're going to see why that is in a second uh, it's because we're kind of jumping in and out of this function using respawns um, instead of blocking we don't actually allow any kind of blocking inside of task functors in the cocos interface and so uh, cocos tasking interface and so anything that you need across multiple invocations of the, of the task functor uh, needs to be a, a data member. So here we're making um, the dependency that represents our child task. So I'm using dependency and predecessor interchangeably here. Um, I probably shouldn't be, I'm sorry, uh, old habits, but uh, I th always think predecessor is a little bit clearer because no one's ever sure if a dependency comes before or after something. Uh, but anyway, that just for clarity there. So the um, predecessor um, or dependency uh, representing the child task is something we're going to want to store on uh, in a data member. Uh, you can also parameterize uh, a task with what we call immediate parameters or just normal variables. Uh, and you can see that here we are um, constructing this task functor wherever we construct it with a depth parameter that's just an integer, right? And we're storing that in a data member also. Um, and uh, so then uh, we, look, we can look down at the functor, which I've kind of already introduced the header of the functor here, but let's look at the body a little bit and say, um, here we're gonna, so we're doing recursion, just like normal synchronous recursion, we need to have a base case or you'll recurse forever, right? So here our, our base case is if depth equals one, right? So we're gonna stop. So we're gonna give, they're gonna, the user's gonna give us some depth. Let's say our depth is 10, okay? Um, the user's gonna give us some depth and then we're gonna start cutting, counting down uh, from, uh, from 10 or from whatever until we hit this one condition, and that's gonna be the place where we don't spawn another task. But if we're not there, uh, we need to know whether we've spawned the task yet, right? Um, remember this paradigm is that we, we're not blocking uh, in this entire interface. So uh, either, we're, we, uh, either we are, either, either the thing is ready before we start, something is ready before we start, or we have to respawn ourselves dependent on it to um, ensure that we are ready before, that it is ready before we start. And when I say ready, it means that we can uh, call the dot get method, get the output value out of it um, and all of those other things. So here we're going to check if dep is null, which means have we, uh, have we spawned a task associated with it yet? If not, we're gonna go ahead and spawn a single child task. Remember, we're making like a recursive chain here. This is just for demonstration purposes. It's being silly a little bit, but um, we're gonna make a recursive chain here. So we, we spawn a child task that is of type my task uh, on our scheduler, right? 
on the same scheduler that this was spawned on. So member.scheduler is how you get the scheduler out. And uh, we're going to spawn it with depth minus one so that we actually hit our recursive base case eventually. Right? And then we can't do anything with that dependency uh, until we or someone else depends on it. Right? So you need to basically uh, respawn. In this case, we're going to respawn ourselves dependent on depth. And this basically means that Cocos will not call the call operator of this current object again, right? This object is persistent. This object stays alive. It's going to get the call operator called again, but the data members are going to be the same as when we exited, right? Um, all of the rest of the state of the functor is going to stay the same. Uh, so we're going to respawn ourselves here uh, with this task as a dependency, this child task as a dependency, which will guarantee us that when Cocos calls this call operator again, it is safe for us to call depth.get. Does that make sense? Uh, so this is, this is the, the general pattern. And if you've seen task-based programming before, you've probably seen depth.get just called directly. And that's um, because depth.get blocks. And there are a number of technical reasons why we can't do that, technical and uh, performance reasons why we can't really do that in, in Cocos tasking in a performance portable way. Um, part of it has to do with how you have to do stack frames and suspend contexts and things like that. So basically, uh, we don't. We don't let you do that. Um, so uh, depth.get does not block. Just keep that in mind. And there's no depth.wait or anything like that. So let's talk about one more level of abstraction here, the scheduler. Um, basically, all you need to know about schedulers, schedulers are like this one layer of abstraction or of performance portability beyond execution spaces. So execution spaces are this abstraction that we have, right, for performance portability that allows us to write one thing um, that can work without being necessarily specific about what hardware it's going to run on, right? we uh, can write code that is generic over different hardware. Um, it turns out that task-based programming and scheduling of task-based programs is a complicated enough problem that there's, there's, there's like basically provably no optimal way to do it, right? And, the, and beyond that, the optimality for different problem types can vary wildly. Um, and so we generally wanna encourage you to write a um to to write your program to be generic over the scheduling strategy right and we provide a few different scheduling strategies but what you need to know for now is you can temp you can for instance template your functor on the scheduling policy or the scheduler sorry and uh you can make your basic futures your basic futures have a given scheduler type to them so basic future is is what Coco's future is a shortcut for. Um, basic future is just basically basic future with the default scheduler on a given execution space. So schedulers themselves are parameterized in execution space, but this is just one more layer of performance portability because scheduling strategies can vary so significantly from problem to problem. Uh, and this is a well-known problem in task-based programming models. Um, and basically the only solution is to be generic um, and figure it out later. All right, so this is what the uh, spawn from the host looks like. It's, it's a very manual process right now. Uh, the, the, uh, all of this boilerplate on top is currently like not generated for you or anything. And there's a reason for that. It's that um, unlike in synchronous programming, uh, with asynchronous programming, there's no real way to determine how many stack frames can be alive at one time, right? How many, um, how much memory is going to be taken up by that, that um, and that, that answer can be quite problem dependent and scheduler dependent. And so right now we don't try and guess at that for you. We figure you know your problem, you'll have some idea of the number of maximum number of tasks you'll spawn and the number that'll be alive at one time. And uh, we will um, just use the amount of memory that you give us uh, with our scheduler. So you have to create a mem what's called a memory pool 
For now, you can just kind of copy and paste this or, or use what's already in the exercise. It's set up for you in the exercise. Um, these are kind of parameters you can fine tune later on when you're, once you're optimizing your, your, uh, your scheduling uh, and your, your task-based program. Uh, but for now, you create a scheduler and then you spawn um, a task with the scheduler. Um, and that's what you need to know about schedulers for now. The other thing is that on the host and only on the host, you can wait on a scheduler, which waiting on a scheduler guarantees that all of the futures uh, to that, that are part of that scheduler that were created before the wait um, or created by any child tasks of those tasks um, will be ready by the time uh, wait returns. Right, and nothing is guaranteed to happen until wait until wait is called. So um, keep both of those things in mind. And so that's the point at which you know wait is kind of your heavy seven hundred pound gorilla that you're going to throw at it and say, I um, am back up to coarse grain world. I am no longer caring about you know super low latency performance um, and fine grain tasking. So you only really want to call it once you actually need the values back on the host. Um, and you may need that for output or for various other reasons. So let's talk about things to keep in mind. Uh, and then we have one more thing to introduce and then we're going to talk about the exercise. So um, unlike other task-based programming models, uh, Coco's tasks always run to completion. Uh, so they are, uh, that's an easy kind of um, fundamental thing to keep in mind when you're reading a program and trying to figure out what's going on. Tasks run to completion. They don't block. No one else can block you if you're calling someone else's function inside of your task. They can't block you if they're using Cocos tasking. Um, Future.get does not block. You're just in this entirely non-blocking world, right? And the way to actually connect things that you do need to depend on is to be explicit about it, is to respawn yourself or spawn a different task dependent on that thing, right? So instead of blocking in the middle of, of the stack frame, right, we are spawning a, a new starting point to the stack frame, right? It's, a, it's kind of a limitation to how stack frames work on, on programs and compilers and computers, right? Um, to some extent, right? Resuming in the middle of a stack frame is not something we can do. So we want to be able to have an efficient way to say, here's the, the thing causing this to, the thing that this is waiting on, right? The thing that this needs before it can run more. And here's the piece of code that needs to run when that thing's ready. Um, and, and doing that within the language um, without changing the language or whatever is um, this is one of the best ways to do it um, and uh, in the far future we will have uh, coroutine support we actually have a prototype for that already um, where this this can be done much much more cleanly and uh, C20 coroutines will actually just basically do this for you but for now don't worry about that um, so the second argument to respawn can be either a predecessor or a scheduler. It's not a full execution policy. So respawn will just respawn the current task, the this task, um, with a um, uh, with the same policy as before, but potentially with a different predecessor. Um, so it doesn't actually launch anything necessarily. It it can't. Um, it, to some extent, it can't, right? Because a task instance can't be running at the same time as itself. So it, it won't actually run until at least the, um, the function returns, right? Um, but it uh, basically just marks the function for, for respawning, right? The function. Um, and tasks can only have one predecessor at a time. So you can have a, a predecessor when the task is created and you can have predecessors when the task is respawned. Uh, but if you want to create multiple, if you want to have multiple predecessors, um, you can either respawn multiple times, which is inefficient. You don't generally want to do that. If you know about, if you know about all of the things, 
or you can use this win all construct. We talk about this win all construct in a second. Okay, so to create an aggregate future, you're going to use the scheduler dot win all uh, method. And um, there's a few things you need to know here. So the way Cocos futures work, uh, any future in Cocos is convertible to a void future of the same type. So um, the uh, here we've spawned a couple of tasks, you know, F1 and F2. And if we need F3 to depend on those both, right, um, we have to create an aggregate future with win all. And so to do that in Cocos, it's kind of primitive, um, but it's what we have for now. You make an array. Remember that we can cast any future to avoid future. So this is guaranteed to be safe here, right? And um, scheduler.winall returns a void future also. So now that we've spawned F3 as, a, um, as dependent on, F, on, on this aggregate future F12, we can know that inside of func xy, it is safe to call f1.get and f2.get. Now, normally this is kind of compacted on this slide, but normally you probably have some way of passing these handles f1 and f2 to the um, func xy, either through the constructor or as data members or uh, somehow some, some, some way of putting those actual objects into a place that's accessible by the call operator of func xy. Uh, but Cocos never really delivers you the value associated with the thing you depend on. You have to store that thing that you depend on in your task functor in order to access its value. And you have to depend on it in order to um, determine that it's ready. So this is a very low level interface. We're dealing with very, very uh, fine-grained tasking and very low latency requirements um, that we had from some users on this. Uh, and so uh, that's part of the reason why this, this is uh, such a restrictive interface here, uh, but it is fast. So uh, that's the upside. Um, and you can build things on top of it pretty easily that are a little safer. So, um, and we're, we're, we're working on some of those things for the future. But uh, the general idea here, take away from this slide, win all is, is, is how you aggregate uh, predecessors. And uh, when you aggregate a predecessor, if you need to access the values from the things that it's, that it's dependent on, you uh, need to uh, pass those, those futures through somehow to the functor that needs to access them. Uh, I mean, so I guess I haven't said this yet, but it's true of pretty much every future-based tasking interface. Futures are at, go in one direction, right? They only become ready. They don't become unready or anything. So if you depend on something that depends on something else, right, then you can assume that the, uh, the second thing, the thing that you depend on, is ready if the first thing's ready. Uh, sorry, I said that backwards, but the, the thing that your, dependent, your predecessor depends on um, is ready if your predecessor is ready. So in this case, we've done that through F12, right? All right. So that was probably a lot, especially if you've never done uh, tasking before. I would encourage you, if you're on the live call, to go back and look for a, you know, a 30 minute tutorial on structured concurrency um, or on future based uh, uh, programming or on. Um, you know, even standard future from C++, which is a little bit different, but, um, and uh, then maybe come back and listen to this on the YouTube uh, uh, recording of this and see if it makes a little bit more sense. Um, it's a lot to get your mind around, so don't worry if it's, it's a little bit difficult. So here's the, um, the example, the exercise we're gonna do, uh, and then I'll hand it back over to Christian to sum things up. Uh, so, Desi, if I may, the, the location of the exercise change. It's exercises uh, tasking. Oh, exercises slash tasking. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll make a note of that in the YouTube comments and uh, in the chat here. 
um, or in the YouTube description. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so here we go. Uh, we're going to take a, a serial algorithm, kind of the dumbest, um, most naive way of computing Fibonacci numbers recursively. And we're going to make it into a, a task-based program that can run in parallel, right? Um, and so uh, this, this, you know, the Fibonacci numbers are always just uh, recursively defined with n minus the sum of n, the n minus first and n minus second uh, Fibonacci number, right? So one way we could do that is to say, have this recursive base case for zero and one, um, uh, which is this n, if n is less than two. And then otherwise, uh, we just kind of naively recurse. But the important and interesting thing for task-based programming is that, well, fib of n minus one and fib of n minus two, at least in the most naive um, approach to this problem, are uh, completely independent of each other, right? So we can spawn them in one place, but we, can't, we don't need their return values until we're going to go to do the sum, right? So we can spawn them both and then stick our handles to the return values into that sum spot, right? If that makes any sense. We're kind of separating the call site from the return site um, and being clear about where we need the return values. So we're going to, the, the exercise is to try and program this with um, Coco's tasking. There's a little bit of guidance in the uh, exercise folder uh, and in the comments. Um, and of course, the Slack is always available for questions. Um, yeah, feel free to ping the general channel. Ping me directly is fine also uh, on, the, on the Coco Slack. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, keep in mind that you're going to use, you're going to want to use scheduler.winall uh, somewhere in here probably. Uh, so this kind of hits all of the main points. We're all, we are only using single tasks here. There's no reason to use team tasks here. Um, but uh, otherwise, everything's the same. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to go ahead. If there were, were there any questions on the chat that would be helpful for me to address in the bigger group? Yeah, I will do that in a second. Can we, uh, let's switch for sh uh, screen share. Can you stop? Yeah. Okay, um, so there were actually uh, two questions which I think might be useful to answer. One was, can you pass uh, futures by value around? Daisy? Oh, you're muted again. Let me unmute you. Uh, participants, come on. Daisy, Daisy, Daisy. Here, I asked you to unmute. Yeah, so um, Coco's futures are. Okay, I think we lost Daisy. Worry about binding references to them or perfect forwarding of them or anything like that. Okay, I think the answer was yes. Uh, we have a thing, I mean, you're breaking a bit up, but let's try that as, uh, can you give like a three minute summarization how, uh, how this compares to stood async? Oh boy. If you can um, tell me, if you say that it's 20 minutes, then we'll leave that for later. <laughs> well, um, Coco's tasking isn't a dumpster fire. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, uh, stood async uh, does, launches a thread, which has a lot of uh, thread-like uh, things associated with it, uh, like thread identity. Uh, stood async uh, returns a future that is potentially blocking. Um, Stood async uh, uh, does a lot of things, uh, is much more coarse grained than what we're aiming at here. It doesn't make necessarily make reuse of things from a pool or anything like that. Um, and uh, what else? 
So today sync does have a deferred launch, which is kind of like uh, Coco's task spawn, uh, but it's actually a mandatory deferred, if I understand correctly, which is uh, different from Coco's task spawn, which can start at any point. Um, but otherwise, you're on the right track, right? Uh, Stood async is an early attempt at a, uh, a tasking interface in Cocos, or in, sorry, in Cocos, in, in uh, the standard library. And, uh, you know, we're working on new ones in C++. This is a, an influencer of, of that, actually, of the, the newer programming models that we're working on. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I hope that, does that answer your question? I, I could go into more details. I'd probably rather do so on the Slack uh, than here because I think they're kind of minutia. But in general, you're on the right track, but there are, there are quite a few key differences with respect to blocking, especially. Okay, thanks. So with that, uh, we're basically done. You know, uh, we talked today about tasking, which we just finished. Uh, we also talked about SIMD types and how we help vectorizing your loop. We talked about outer loop vectorization and things like that. We talked about how we introduced the concept of a storage and temporary types for SIMD and, uh, you know, try it out. It's on SIMD math uh, in the Cocos organization, in the Cocos GitHub organization. We also talked about the blocking behavior and to recap that a bit, uh, execution space instances execute war work in order of dispatch. So it's a FIFO queue, first in, first out. Operations in distinct execution space instances can overlap. This is very similar to CUDA streams. It's the exact same kind of semantic concept. Each execution space type has a default instance and what, that's what gets used as the instance when you don't provide one to like a parallel four. Uh, and Cocos fence waits for completion of everything while execution space instance fence waits just for the um, one execution space instance. So if you have more questions on that, right, uh, feel free to join our Slack channel and ask us there. In module six next week, we're gonna talk a little bit about Python and Fortran data interoperability. So how to pass data back and forth between C++, uh, Cocos and, you know, Python and Fortran. We're gonna talk about uh, how to make, you know, Cocos and MPI work uh, together. So largely a bit of basic usage, which is actually fairly trivial. Uh, and then we'll mostly gonna talk a bit about performance considerations in particular on uh, GPU machines. Uh, and last but not least, we're gonna talk about uh, PGAS, effectively how uh, a new capability in Cocos, uh, or you know, kind of semi-external to Cocos, uh, which provides global arrays via Cocos. Uh, it's a fairly new feature, we just released that but we think that that uh, can be, you know, more and more useful in the future. And so we really wanted to include that. As I said, don't forget, join our Slack channel, uh, drop into our office hours on Tuesdays. If you have questions, you know, we are there to discuss everything you need to discuss. We can also help with exercises if you have questions on that. Uh, you can find updates on the lecture series, you know, if necessary, or well, so far we haven't really done any. Uh, at that link and then recordings and slides uh, in Cocos link, the lectures. Uh, the slides are already uploaded for the voice slides here. Um, we'll hopefully have the recording up soon too. And thanks for keeping with us today and hope to see you all uh, next week again. Bye.